first of all, thank you for having me. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. And I want to thank the audience members for taking their time to join us tonight. So without um, any further delay, I'll start our start. And Sue, um, you're exactly right. We're going to talk about a little bit about atrial fibrillation and specifically the role of the left atrial appendage closure for stroke reduction. So um, I have no conflicts of interest. Um, first of all, let's talk a little bit about what is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation occurs in the top part of the heart and those are called the atrium and it's the most common arrhythmia worldwide. Uh, currently, as of 2010, which is 12 years ago, believe it or not, there was an estimated 4.5 million people in the United States with atrial fibrillation. That number is going to double um, in the next, um, what, 2022, in 18 years, or 28 years to 9 million. So as you can see, the numbers continue to grow. One of the major risk factors is just purely aging. One thing that's been associated uh, with stroke with atrial fibrillation is the left atrial appendage. And in two studies, what they found is about 90% of the blood clot that's formed in people with non-valvular, and we can get into that a little bit later, atrial fibrillation, 90% of the time, it seems that the blood clot forms within the left atrial appendage. And as you can see, as the age goes up, the incidence of AFib um, is greater. So once you hit ages between 80 to 89, up to a quarter of the patient's um, stroke is associated with atrial fibrillation. Now, as we have moved forward with assessing the atrial fibrillation, Previous to closing the atrial fibrillation, there was an assumption that there was only one type of atrial appendage. As we get more and more knowledge, we find that there's so many different types and they have been given different names. For example, this is called, referred to as a chicken wing. This um, is referred to as a cauliflower. This is referred to as a windsock. And this is referred to as a cactus. And there's many, many more types that uh, we will encounter. And uh, this is a series, and I can, I can fill the screen multiple times, just with the different types of atrial uh, appendage that's been identified, which um, is important as we will talk about um, how we manage this. And again, this is the different morphologies, both from, um, as we described, cactus, windsock, cauliflower, and then chicken wing. Um, these are the gross anatomies that you might see in these um, types of hearts. And in general, when you're talking about atrial fibrillation, you're talking about five domains. The initial part is the acute diagnosis and treatment with medications, whether it's to slow the heart rate down or to, to get it back into a regular rhythm. The second one is lifestyle changes and treating the under, underlying cardiovascular conditions. And what do, that, what do I mean by that? Life, lifestyle changes, including diet, exercise, weight management, and alcohol consumption. One thing that's been really shown to impact increased risk of atrial fibrillation is how much alcohol you drink. And then cardiovascular conditions, treating high blood pressure specifically to reduce the risk of atrial fibrillation in that situation. The third component of the five domains is and the cornerstone is oral anticoagulation. And some of you might have heard about Coumadin, Eliquis, um, 
Zeralto uh, and Pradaxa as reducing the risk of stroke, what they have found is oral anticoagulation can reduce the risk of stroke in, in patients with atrial fibrillation by about 70%. Then you come into rate control, what medications we give, and you might have heard metropolol, deltaizam, and then the fifth, antiarrhythmic drugs, and flecainide, amiodrone, um, ticosin, and then cardioversion, where you do try to get the heart back into a regular rhythm by shocking the heart back into a rhythm. And then probably have heard catheter ablations, where they go through the groin and they try to either by something called radio frequency, which is heat, to get the areas that are producing atrial fibrillation or freezing called cryoablation. And then they're more in people who are more resistant, atrial fibrillation surgery. So those are the five domains. The one thing that people always talk about with atrial fibrillation is I didn't feel anything. And that is true. About 40 to 50% of people who go into atrial fibrillation sometimes do not feel any rapid heart rate or change in symptoms. The people who get advanced, they might feel shortness of breath with activity because their heart rate is at baseline going really fast. So when they get up to do something, they feel more short of breath. Some people feel chest discomfort. Some people feel lightheaded, like they're going to feel pass out. So there, some people feel fatigue. Um, and if your heart rate goes fast enough or long enough, sometimes it can cause your left heart function to reduce. And you might have heard decrease ejection fraction or heart failure. So here's um, one of the cases. This is a 75 year old man, history of a heart attack before with stenting in 2008, high blood pressure, long standing persistent atrial fibrillation. And I'll get to that. There's many different types of atrial fibrillation. There's the persistent, that means you're chronically in atrial fibrillation. And there's proxismal, that means you go in and out of atrial fibrillation. Um, this gentleman had uh, mild Alzheimer's. And then there was something called cerebral amyloid angiopathy, which is abnormal protein formation in the brain, which can increase the risk of bleeding. And our neurology colleagues referred him to us for left atrial appendage closure. So some things you might hear from your um, clinicians, your doctors is Chad Vascor. Chad Vascor is right now used to determine your risk of atrial fibrillation uh, stroke. And there is congestive heart failure as a risk, high blood pressure as a risk, age greater than 75 is actually two points instead of one point, diabetes is one point, history of stroke or TIA is two points, vascular disease, um, meaning if you had heart problems, um, heart attack before, or blockages in your legs or your neck arteries give you one point, and age between 65 to 74 gives you one point, and um, female sex gives you one point. Has blood score is the risk of bleeding, and these are the scores from here. And as you see this, as the points add up, your risk of stroke increases. So this gentleman had chronic persistent atrial fibrillation. He had a CHAD VAS score of four, his age, high blood pressure, vascular disease. Because he was over 75, he got two points. His HAS blood score was three, again, aspirin, predisposition to bleeding and age. So we had a meeting and we really discussed the pros and cons of the increased risk of stroke and the increased bleeding from his abnormal protein deposition in his brain. And after discussion, we agreed to move forward with the appendage. And why do we do this? These are some registry data. And one thing they found was 
about 50% of people who are started on blood thinning medication stop blood thinning medication within one year time period. And then here's the newer medications that are there. And you can see at two years in this population, 50% of the people stop taking Coumadin and about 20%, sorry, 30% of people at two years start taking the Eliquis, Pradaxa, Zeralto medication. So it's not uncommon for patients to stop taking their medications for a variety of reasons. This is another explanation. As your chad vas score increases, as we discussed, your risk of stroke increases, and simultaneously, your risk of bleeding also increases. So it's a double hazard. The more risk scores you have, the more bleeding. So this gentleman came in, we perform, sorry, let me do that again. We, um, this is his left atrial appendage. This is the catheter. You might see this, this is the called the transesophageal echocardiogram. So we're in the left side of the heart. This is the left atrium. Atrium, sorry, left atrium. This is the left ventricle, bottom of the heart, and that's the appendage. We take a picture to make to accurately look at the size. And this one is more of a cactus with multiple lobes. And then this is our device. This is how it's connected. We deploy and we take a picture because. We want to make sure it's completely sealed and two, as important, it's not going anywhere. And then we let the device go and then we watch it, it's securely sitting there. And then the procedure is done, all the equipment is coming out. This is the information, the, the studies that were used by the FDA to approve the Watchman device. And again, you can see Bleeding and stroke were favorable. And here's all the studies done with the Watchman device. This line indicates people who are not treated at all. This line shows treated with Coumadin. And these show the Watchman device. And as you can see, on average, they're, they're about equivalent to being on blood thinning medication. Again, at that time, there were 6,000 procedures, but I can tell you by now, there's over 70,000 procedures that have been performed in the United States with the Watchman device. And these are the complication rates that are associated. Percardial tamponade, meaning that sometimes when you put the device, fluid leaks out and there's blood around the heart. And then stroke, device, embolization, and death, as you can see. Now, the Watchman device has gone through multiple iterations, and now we have a new one called the Watchman Flex. Um, they did a study on this. It showed to be very favorable with less complications. And I'll show you why less complications. This is the old Watchman device. As you can see, it had these prongs that kind of were coming out, and you can see how it looked. This is the new Watchman device. It's a Flex. So it creates a ball. So these dimes are not pushing against things. So it has even decreased the complications more. It has these little uh, anchors that hold on to the tissues. So the likelihood of the device dislodging is extremely low. And they took away this area. So the fabric, there's less metal exposed to the bloodstream. So less likely blood clot forming onto it. Um, there's an, another device that's been recently um, approved by the FDA called the amulet device. They compare it to the Watchman device and it shows about the same outcomes at 12 months. So um, the FDA approved this device, device success. You can see both of them. This is the older device. The newer device for Watchman is close to 
And uh, so everything looked about the same. So the FDA approved it. This is the amulet device, and this is the watchman device. You can see the, the difference. This is more of a um, disc shaped with the anchors here. This is more of a ball shaped. This is the tissue covering the device. So the FDA approved this device in Watchmen March 13, 2015. And now it's been a year since the amulet device has been approved. This is a, set, uh, a second case with the amulet device, 73-year-old woman, history of left breast cancer, um, cardiomyopathy, weakened heart due to uh, doxyribicin, congestive heart failure, proxismal atrial fibrillation, she goes in and out of it, high blood pressure, and multiple bleeding from the gastrointestinal tract. Her CHAD VAS score was four and her HAS blood score was two. We had a discussion about risk and benefits and based on her and her family's decision, we moved forward. Here's um, again, the left atrial appendage. This is the transesophageal echocardiogram, which has an ultrasound to allow us to look at this. She has a pacemaker on ICD. And this is our catheter. We inject through it. We assess the size. This is the Watchman Flex. This is a ball it's slowly coming out. And we deploy. We make sure it's nicely stuck in there. And this is our injection to make sure it's completely sealed. Now, remember, there's a fabric here. So when we inject the dye, there's a delayed filling. But now the back part is not filled at all. And she's going to be on anticoagulation. And at 45 days, we'll take a look at it. If everything looks good, she's on aspirin and clopidogrel. And at six months, we discontinued the clopidogrel. And she's just on aspirin alone. Here's another case, 79-year-old with a history of stroke coronary disease, hypertension, anemia, proxismal atrial fibrillation, COPD. Her CHAD VAS score was seven. Her HAS blood score was three. Once again, we brought her in. And now we're doing also a different type. This is called the intracardiac echocardiogram. This is our transesophageal echocardiogram. She had a chicken wing shape. Watchman Flex was deployed. We had an excellent seal. You can see this intracardiac ice showed in two different positions to make sure the device looked good. And here's the Watchman. I'm sorry, this is grainy, but here's the Watchman device here, and it seals the entire appendage. These are the multiple different types of devices in production to close the left atrial appendage. So in the future, I anticipate in the next five to six years, there'll be even more devices on the market for the appendage closure because as we discussed, the population is aging. As, we, as the population ages, there's more and more um, um, atrial fibrillation being diagnosed simultaneously as we age, we, there's more and more increased risk of bleeding. Predominant risk of bleeding is from the gastrointestinal tract. Esophagus, stomach, large bowel are the most common, mostly from the sto uh, stomach, the small intestine, the large intestine. Then there's bleeding in the, in the brain is another issue. Um, so those are the most common type of um, patients that are referred are bleeding. I will tell you about 10% of the cases that we have impl implanted the device in are for lifestyle issues. And what do I mean by that? There have been issues when excessive bruising on the skin. And then we have patients, even though as we get older, they want to be active, skiing, rock climbing, 
and they want to continue to do the hiking steep inclines. They want to continue horseback riding. These are just some of the cases we have. And because they want to enjoy their lifestyle, they come to us because of lifestyle issues to, uh, to get off of blood thinning medication. And just recently on September 6th for the Watchman Flex device, before, after 45 days, um, for 45 days, we had to put patients on Coumadin or Eliquis, Pradaxa, Zeralto. But recently, FDA has approved that patients can go right off the bat on aspirin and clopidogrel. Uh, clopidogrel, you might have heard it, is also called Plavix. And it's just, um, a more potent kind of aspirin, if I may say. So, um, so I'm going to stop here to see if there's any questions. Uh, there has been a, a few questions. Um, uh, is, oh. Oh. Uh, oh. I was gonna say, I see the question. Oh, you can. Okay, you can see the questions. Okay, yeah. if you want to answer the ones that okay. are part of what you were talking oh, sure. about. So one question was, will AF make a rate change? And and Sue, let me know if these are the same questions you're seeing. Um, will AF make a rate change that will show up on my Fitbit? So there are wearable devices, whether it's Apple Watch or... Um, uh, or Fitbit or any of these devices that have algorithms um, incorporated that pick up a fast heart rate and irregular heart rate, and they will do it. They will say whether you're an AFib. It would be great if you can download and print those and contact your primary care physician or cardiologist if you are seeing them to let them know that this is happening so you can be seen. So those kind of wearable devices can help identify. Um, the second question was bleeding from where? Bleeding can be anywhere from intracranial or in the bleeding from the brain. We have had people who have had massive nose bleeding, but the majority of bleeding occurs in the stomach or in small intestine or large intestine. The AFib is not caused usually by atrial, the atrial appendage. The atrial appendage, if you want to think about it, is, um, is an, if you want to imagine what I call a room, the atrial appendage is like an alcove. If you have also, um, um, so it's like a side pocket to the top part of the heart. And that's the area the blood can stagnate sometimes. And when it stagnates, it can form blood clots. That blood clot can be dislodged and go anywhere in the body. And a lot of times it can go to the brain and cause the stroke. Um, what is a watchman device? A watchman device or an ambulance are devices that um, are the, from different companies, but basically they close or wall off the left atrial appendage. Um, are there any contraindications to closing the atrial appendage? Um, it depends. And that's why we ask people to get a, usually a CAT scan or a transesophageal echocardiogram beforehand, because we want to see the shape, the size, and make sure there's no blood clot. Because um, these devices only go to a certain range, and we want to make sure that the appendage is the right size and shape. Um, so, um, a very good question here, what particular patient would benefit from an intracardiac intervention? Um, what, how much, what is the risk benefit? And if one has an episode of AFib, does it help to take metropolol? So to answer these questions, the majority of our patients are in their 70s, 80s, and some of our patients are in their 90s. It's the same reason. Atrial fibrillation tends to be more common um, as we grow older. Bleeding tends to be more common when we go, when, as we grow older. 
So as you can see, our, the vast majority of our patients are in their 70s and 80s. That uh, we do. What are the risks of this procedure? This procedure is generally done under general anesthesia, and we're exploring doing it on non, not under general anesthesia, but it's done under general anesthesia. Uh, we go from the right groin, the right common femoral vein, and then under X-ray and ultrasound, we go to the left side of the heart, we inject dye, we see how big everything is, we confirm what we know from before, and we pick one of the right devices to place in. And then once we're done, we come out, tubes come out. If patients are done early in the morning and they look, they feel great, sometimes they can go home late in the afternoon. Otherwise, they stay overnight and go home the next day. The main limitation of this procedure is just taking it easy for the next 24, 48 hours to let the groin heal up. So you can climb stairs, you can walk around, but we ask you not to lift heavy objects um, for 24, 48 hours. And then it takes about a couple of days for the anesthesia to wear off. You might feel a little bit of tiredness after that, but that's basically the uh, it. And the main risk as we described is usually less than 2%, including all encompassing, uh, encompassing bleeding and damage to the artery or vein, infection, working in the heart, heart attack, stroke, death, pericardial effusion, bleeding, all that combined is less than 2%. Um, metropolol is useful to controlling the rate of atrial fibrillation, but has no impact on the risk of stroke. Um, what determines the choice between atrial fibrillation or ablation? Ablation is really to help in people who can't be controlled with medications to, um, to decrease the burden of atrial fibrillation, but currently it doesn't necessitate not being on blood thinning medication to reduce the risk of stroke because going back, you can still be in, in um, go in and out of atrial fibrillation and not feel it and still be have a risk of stroke. So two different things. Ablation is more for rate control or putting you back in a regular rhythm. Anticoagulation, appendage closures with the watchman device or amulet are there to reduce the risk of stroke. Uh, what criteria for choosing who should get? Basically is your CHAD VAS score. It should be about three or higher. And we have done people who are two as long as it's approved by insurance and the patient has a um, good reason. And um, so it really depends on your CHAD VAS score, your risk of bleed, or as I said, if there's a um, quality of life limiting issue to get a closure device, people who are at a high risk of falling and injuring themselves, people who want to do sports that limit their, um, increase their risk of falling or injuring and causing bleeding. Um, if you feel like um, your heart rate is going fast, you get short of breath with activity, all these kind of things you should uh, discuss with your clinician to see if you should be evaluated for atrial fibrillation. Proxismal AFib, it depends on your symptoms. If you feel like you're getting more and more burden of AFib, so you feel it more and more, please talk to your cardiologist. There are medications that can help you. And if the medications don't, then you can discuss uh, being referred to an electrophysiologist to discuss ablation. As of right now, and this is a very, uh, this is an excellent question. Just because I have AFib sometime, does it mean I have an increase? As of right now, we don't know what the burden, the cutoff is to basically say, hey, look, if, you, if I only get it once a month versus I get it once a week versus I get it every six months, should I, um, am I at a worse risk for getting a stroke? So there are actually ongoing studies looking at that 
specific question. So that's an excellent question about this. Um, the cardio mobile is um, also useful uh, when you feel like you might be going into atrial fibrillation or any arrhythmia. That's very um, useful de uh, uh, device to uh, be able to, you know, detect arrhythmias. So any kind of these variable de uh, wearable devices can be very useful. Uh, why general anesthesia? Right now, that has been the standard because as you can see, the heart is beating. We're trying to implant something. Sometimes taking a deep breath or moving can move our equipment. But as I mentioned, there's more and more studies coming out to see if we can do this without general anesthesia. So that's an excellent question. So hopefully, you know, we'll have more answers and capability to do this without general anesthesia. Best way to screen for atrial yeah. oh, yes. yeah. Best way to screen for atrial fibrillation. Um, right now, there's no recommended for screening for AFib, uh, atrial fibrillation. But if you have a wearable device like an Apple Watch or a Fitbit or anything in that, that if you're concerned, that can help you. If you have palpitations, and um, if if you ever had a TIA or a stroke and there's no clear cut cause, those people are evaluated for um, atrial for, um, for atrial fibrillation. So it's basically if you have symptoms or an unknown cause for stroke, we recommend a screening. But there's no general screening right now. There there have been a few studies that have been published at on this, um, but um, as of right now, there's no recommendations, just screening everyone for AFib. Does everyone, yes, almost everybody has a left atrial appendage. There's an anomaly where one person might not, but the vast majority of the population do have atrial fibrillation. Um, do I have to see a doctor cardiologist to figure out my CHAD VAS score? No, um, you can, Go on any search engine and type in Chad Vascore calculator, and it will bring a calculator and you can calculate it. But what I would really recommend is if you have atrial fibrillation to talk to your um, primary clinician to discuss it and to see if you're at increased risk of stroke and then discuss being referred to cardiology. How soon after AFib? Um, you should see if you've been diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, you should see, um, be referred for a cardiologist or see your clinician, um, I would say, um, as soon as possible. If one of my parents have AFib, will I be more likely? As you can see, AFib is very common, especially as we age. There are some... Um, atrial fibrillations that are genetically related, but they tend to happen at a much younger age. So if your parents had atrial fibrillation in their 40s and 50s, you might discuss this with your uh, uh, clinician, but on average, those are very rare. The majority are related to age and high blood pressure, alcohol intake, um, people who have coronary artery disease at increased risk, those people who have comorbidities. Um, if I had proxismal atrial tachycardia, SVT, benign arrhythmias most of my life, um, a lot of people have extra heartbeats or PATs. Sometimes if you have a lot, it might increase your risk a little bit for getting um, atrial, being um, at risk for atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter and AFib are like cousins. So yes, we have treated patients who have atrial flutter because in general, a lot of people who develop atrial flutter um, in the future develop atrial fibrillation. Um, there has been some literature about atrial fibrillation and COVID, um, but as of right now, we haven't seen a much higher degree I'm sure those studies are ongoing, but we have seen patients, especially with long COVID, having 
palpitations, faster resting heart rate that are not in atrial fibrillation, that are in a regular rhythm, but their resting rate has increased. So yes, we have seen that. If someone was diagnosed with atrial fibrillation and placed on Xeralto and that has a current lead, what will the clinician? So that's best talk to your uh, clinicians to discuss, hey, look, I have bleeding. And then they, they, they will go through a series of steps to see if the bleeding is coming from the gastrointestinal tract. So they, you might be referred to a gastroenterologist or on the other causes of bleeding. What should I say to my PCP about my concerns for evading AFib? Avoidance of AFib, the best things are risk factor modification. Exercise, eating right, weight management. Um, uh, I didn't mention this, but sleep apnea has been associated with atrial fibrillation. Um, decreasing alcohol intake. All these things have been shown to decrease. There was one study that, that showed that if you do have atrial fibrillation, you exercise, eat right, weight loss, it can reduce the burden of atrial fibrillation significantly. So those kind of things will help you significantly. Um, can AFib disappear or do I have it for life? Um, sometimes if the AFib is related to a specific type of stressor, meaning post-surgery, sometimes it can be a one-off and you can just monitor it. Um, if it's a spontaneous, meaning that AFib happens spontaneously, then you can have different forms of it that it can come and go. Um, but um, those, those are the things that um, you should be aware of. So if you have AFib that's related to a specific cause, trauma or post-surgical, that can be an evaluation that you have with your clinician to see if it's resolved. You might get a monitor to see if it recurs again or not. Does using CPAP uh, machine lower the rate of occurrence of AFib? Um, CPAP machine in general um, has been associated with improving quality of life from sleep, which is really important. There are ongoing evaluations to see if CPAP can actually reduce the burden of atrial fibrillation. Ablation is to decrease the rate of AFib or get you out of AFib, atrial fibrillation, depending on what type of atrial fibrillation. The Watchman device is specifically, or any kind of left atrial appendage closure device, for example, Watchman or Amulet are to reduce the risk of stroke. If cardioversion is not successful, how successful is ablation? That I would say you really need to discuss with your cardiologist because it depends on the duration of atrial fibrillation, how big your left atrial, um, left atrium is. So there's many, many things. If you need a cardiologist, please, um, um, Sue, do we have a way uh, for people to contact us if they want to be seen by cardiology? Yes, I'll look up the number while you're um, while you're talking. Oh, wait a minute, I think I have it here. Um, yes, they can call 413-794-2273 for Bay State Cardiology. 413-794-2273. And of course, um, we have the information on our website at baystatehealth.org. And you can just uh, type, uh, type in heart or uh, cardiology under medical services. And we have a list of information on our website. The next question was, uh, does the duration and how often AFib matters? Again, excellent question. They're actually studying to see if there's a relationship between the duration of atrial fibrillation and stroke for right now, if people have atrial fibrillation and they have a higher risk score, then we do definitely recommend if they don't have increased risk of bleeding to be on anticoagulation. 
Those were some great questions. <laughs> well, well no, done, you. Very, very, <laughs> we can, I can tell Sue that this audience is very well prepared. <laughs> yeah. So I think, you know, the one thing I will tell the, the group, you know, if you have atrial fibrillation, know someone who has atrial fibrillation. Luckily, we live in an era that uh, there's many options. As I said, anticoagulation based on your risk is the cornerstone and it can reduce the risk of stroke simultaneously because it does its work. It does increase your risk of bleeding. So for those subcategories of patients who have increased bleeding risk or have bleeding, there is an option. And what Bay State has committed to, and this is the good thing, whenever these technologies come, we participate in research. We make sure the devices are um, from the research actually give benefit. We make sure we have well-qualified physicians and staff, both from pre to intra-procedure to post-procedure that are available to help you because ultimately it's not about the procedure, it's about you to make sure that we can get you back into your quality of life, to do what you wanna do and enjoy it. Um, uh, one other question, if taking metrocolol only is it necessary to be on any other med to stop potential stroke? Again, medications like metropolol, deltaizam, they're there to control the rate, to control the symptom. Medications like Coumadin, Eliquis, Pradaxa, um, Zeralto, they're there to reduce your rate of stroke. So two different, and uh, there are two different things that are there. One is to control the rate or get you back into sinus rhythm. Medications like amiodrone, fleconide, ticosin, sodalol are there to get you back into a rhythm. Metropolol, deltaizam, verapamil are to control their rate. And medications like Coumadin, Eliquis, Pradaxa, and Zeralto are to reduce your stroke. And devices like the Watchman device and Amulet are invasive devices if you can't take long-term anticoagulation, or there's a, there's a reason to be to have this device, as I explained, that fall risk, or you're very active and you don't want to increase your bleeding risk. The most recent one I can tell you was somebody who likes horseback riding and just didn't want to take any chances. Wonderful. Looks like that's all their, the questions, although there were quite a few that you answered. And great presentation. I love hearing all the success stories too. Thank you for your time, Dr. Latfi. Really wonderful. I know you saw patients all day and you're extremely busy, but grateful for your expertise tonight. No, oh, I, I appreciate it. And I truly appreciate um, you, Sue and Jeff for putting this together. And I, I really want to thank the audience members for being here. And again, a very informed audience team who had excellent questions. Um, uh, fantastic questions. And I appreciate your time. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.